Have you seen this video? This is a video that um, Miles Monroe um, did some years ago. Very interesting. Let's take a listen to what um, what he had to say here. Okay, hold on. Here we go. So the Romans ruled the world, destroyed themselves. Now here's the big part. The Roman Empire did not fall by invasion. It fell by disintegration. Disintegration means it fell apart, like a piece of of cake that just broke up in little pieces. That's how the Roman Empire fell apart. Well, you just broke up. And what happened was everybody scrambled for power. And the result was many little kingdoms. Instead of one kingdom, many little kingdoms. Let me give you some of their names. Spanian, Franco, Belger. This is Roman kingdom. Anglo, Roman kingdoms. Pachuco, Roman kingdoms. We know these kingdoms in English. Franco, France. Belger, Belgium. Porco, Portugal. Anglo, Spanian. They're all kingdoms. Huh. They are all Romans. They are all Romans. So their psyche, their mentality, ingrained. We were chosen by the gods to rule anybody who don't have our traits. They were chosen by the gods to be our servants and our slaves. They are not complete divine beings like us. We are superior. So the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the British, Anglo, call them Anglo. They decided to expand their kingdoms. So they came to Africa and the Caribbean, and we call it colonization. Colonization is the expansion of Greek leadership philosophy. So going to Africa and bringing slaves over as merchandise was easy. Why? Big nose, big lip, dark skin, busy head, black eyes. I found a million servants, they say. So they come to the West, they establish their plantations, whether it is Carolina, or Florida, or Louisiana, or the Bahamas, or Jamaica, or Barbados, or St. Kitts, or St. Thomas, or St. Lucia, or Guyana, or Mexico, they had their plantations, and they couldn't use the people they met here, because they killed them out with disease. And so they went and found some divine slaves, chosen by the gods to work the ground. And they brought them over on ships, and the first ones to bring them was the Portuguese. The Portuguese told the British, we found some people to work the farms. And the British said, where you got them from? They followed us. And they went to the south, the west coast of Africa. And then the French found out. The French said, oh, oh, let's go get some too. And then the Spanish says, oh, let's get some too. And everybody started dashing for divine slaves. Remember, divine means you were chosen by the gods. It's not racism. It's leadership philosophy. That is in the psyche of the system. Oh, I am here, you are here, some of you of my pigmentation and millions of us here in the region because of a leadership philosophy. That's how important leadership is. If the blind lead the blind, we were being led and they convinced you. Matter of fact, if you read the writings of the oppressor, they wrote things like this. They read the Bible on you. They said, now you must be good slaves. And they gave us Jesus. You wonder why, you know, the black Muslims and people like that rose up? Because they even used Jesus as part of manipulation. You know, Jesus said, you must be nice slaves. And then you'll go to heaven. If you go to heaven, you'll get robe and shoes. You can't get them now because we ain't giving you none. But, you know, you get them and you get to heaven. So now we, so the, so the slave in the, in the farm starts singing, I got a shoe. Master, you got a shoe. All of God's children got a shoe. But I ain't going to get mine until I go to heaven. I'll walk all over. See, in other words, you get yours now, Massa. I can get mine when I go to heaven. All of that is brainwashing. Those songs that we used to glory in called Negro Spiritual, you need to read the words of those songs. They are strong songs of conversion for your mind to make sure you never rise above. I used to sing them, so don't look at me funny. I was born in a little town called Baintown. That was a village of slaves. I'm trying to show you where leadership problems come from. So for 394 years, they ruled these islands, and they made all of us believe, you were born to clean my house. You were created to plant my corn. You, you were sent by God to wash my clothes and cook for my children. And so there we were stuck in the back room. Oh, by the way, you know, you ain't got no charisma, so you must be seen 
and not heard. You see, that's all that's part of the system. So you're supposed to work, but no one's supposed to see you. And so the little slave walk around the house cooking, and that's, you know, and they ain't supposed to be around when Massa got friends. See, the whole thing, psychological, that's why some of you all are timid. You are so timid today, and you think you're cool. Timidity was taught. That is why when a man of my pigmentation speaks up, it makes them nervous, because you ain't behaving. Some of y'all wonder why they thought Martin Luther King was a problem. Because he was a black man talking loud. You ain't supposed to talk loud. Stay in your southern church, have church with a stained glass window, and shout by yourself. Don't come out here telling us we're wrong. That was the problem. It was a, it was a leadership problem. To tell Miss Rosa Parks that she's in the wrong seat was very natural for them. You don't understand. You say, there ain't no prejudice. This is the conditioning of the culture. You ain't supposed to sit here. Yeah, but I'm a human. You ain't no complete human. See? <laughs> the, the, the gods told us where you're supposed to sit. In the back, they say. Divine assignment. I'm saying this for a reason. That is still here in the Bahamas. Yes. No matter how much school you go to, no matter how many degrees you get, no matter how much you think you know, when you come back, they tell you, you're just a smart slave. It's a leadership mentality. So now you know why Miles Monroe is angry. You see why I hate oppression? Because I got the truth. I love, I love everybody. I like everybody, you know. I like everybody. <laughs> but don't you ever imagine you're better than me. Mm. Oh, mm -mm. You think you're better? I draw a line. Cross that. That's a being down talk. You don't know about that. And if I fella draw a line, that means fight start. <sighs> mm, 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 mm. Man, there's a whole lot, a whole lot we can talk about on that. But I think uh, Miles Monroe pretty much spoke for himself on that. Um, just you may want to go back and, and listen to that again. I mean, so much. Um, I, I would say starting from when he talked about, you know, Roman and Greek philosophy and how as a people, we need to really understand that, you know, Roman and Greek philosophy, that the world that we live in today, the system that we live in today is still very much guided by Rome and Greek philosophy. And that includes your Bible. And I'm sorry, but there's too many of our people who believe, still believe that this book fell out of the sky, out of the clouds and into your beautiful brown lap. And somehow it overrides all of that. No honey, no sugar, no sir. It is all has been, it's all has been birthed out of Rome and Greek philosophy. That's where it all comes from at the end of the day. And so this is why it's really never ceases to amaze me now, you know, because again, I'm an individual that spent years. This is all I knew that this was the book that fell out of the sky. This is the one that's for us. You know, it's our history book and all of that, right? No, no, it's not. No, as he talked about again, this was something that prior to the Europeans coming into Africa and all going into the deeper parts of Africa because they were already in Egypt, but going into the other parts of Africa, you know, this was an area, this was a space where the people that were already inhabitants in all throughout that continent for thousands, tens of thousands of years, they didn't know anything about the Bible and all that kind of stuff. They didn't know anything about that. And so um, I was going through some of the slides I've had in the past. And um, here's one. I um, uh Oh, not that one. <laughs> I'm still going through them. Hold on. Was it this one? Is this one right here? Here we go. Uh, that was one from our AI um, uh, project that we work on, oh, by the way. <laughs> it's pretty nice. I like that one. Anyway, um, this was I was playing around with um, speaking of AI um, chat um, GPT. And I typed in the question that you see on your screen. It says, why isn't Southern Africa um, in the Bible? Because when you when anytime you talk to anybody and they mention Africa's in the Bible, Africa's in the Bible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But the 
part of Africa that is talked about the most is mainly Northern Africa, particularly Egypt, because again, that's where most of the Bible was written. It was written in Egypt. And that's something that many people don't want to acknowledge, but it's historically true. It wasn't written on little, you know, on ships as Paul was going, you know, to one mission point to another and all that. No, all of that was, most of that was written in Egypt, you know, and we've talked about that and you have to go back to our videos where we break all that down and show you all of that. This is not me just making it up. This is not me just kind of conjuring up out of nowhere. No, it's history. It's facts, facts. So anyway, this, if you take a look at this, it says, um, I, I asked the question, why isn't Southern Africa mentioned in the Bible? Now, why do I mention Southern Africa? Because when you trace back where many of us come that are in the diaspora, I'm talking about in the Americas, which includes um, South America, which also can include um, the Caribbean, wherever you'll find um, the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. And you can also say um, the, the um, um, Muslim slave trade too, the Arab slave trade too, because that doesn't get talked about the most. Once the world began to the, the world outside of central and South Africa began to realize, wait a minute, there's some people down here. Now ain't already some people down here. They got a lot of resources and they got, once they started figuring all this stuff out, then the first thing that came in their mind was, okay, we're going to make them slaves. And that's exactly what happened. But first we got to roll in there and we got to tell them, we got to let them know, Hey, Jesus came to save you. Now get on that boat. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much what happened. And so, um, so yeah, so that's what happened. So, I want you to take a look at this um, statement. So I typed in there. Okay, my point. Many of us in the diaspora did come, can trace our roots to Central and Southern Africa. Many of us can. And, um, and so that's why I asked that question. So anyway, here's the response I got. It says, Southern Africa is not mentioned specifically in the Bible. Because the Bible was written by Middle Eastern and Mediterranean authors in the ancient Near East, we've talked about this, who were not familiar with the geography and cultures of Southern Africa. The biblical authors focused on the area in which they lived and the people they encountered, and their writings reflect their own cultural and historical context. Those of you who have been following this platform for a moment, you know we have broken that down. We didn't necessarily need Jet, Chat GPT to tell us that, but it just gets it short and to the point. <clears throat> when you go back, if this is your first time on this platform, we've talked about this many, many times. What I would encourage you to do is do a search for the travels of all the disciples, which later became the apostles. When Jesus told him, he said, go into all the world and to preach the gospel. I am challenging you to do this. You can do a Google image search. It's as simple as that. You will see exactly where the biblical account. Okay. I'm saying biblical. I'm not saying historical biblical account. It tells us exactly where they went and guess where all of them went, where Rome and Greece were in control. That's right. You'll see they went all, they were all throughout the Mediterranean and they went as far east as India. But when you look at, start going to central and southern Africa, they, I guess the bus lines wasn't going, wasn't working in those days. So they could figure out, they can figure out the route to get all the way to India, but they could not, for some reason, get could not get past Egypt. Gee, I wonder why. And so anyway, but like I said, again, when you look at so, oh, so much I want to say, but basically when we listen to, you know, uh, people talking about history, you notice people a lot of times says this is prehistoric. Never allow yourself to get caught up in that prehistoric. What does that mean? That means before history. The question you need to ask yourself is whose history and what history are we talking about? History is just a continual thing. So what do you mean? So when someone says prehistory, 
what they're implying is, oh, anything that took place that concerns us, we are calling it history. Anything that took place where we don't really care about or we don't want to talk about, we call that prehistorical. That's why you have tens of thousands of years of events, of kingdoms, of technologies, of all kinds of things that have happened throughout Central, Southern Africa, going, oh, and then you, you know, jump over the ocean, you go into the, the Incas and the, you know, the people that were in these lands as well. You notice that's all referred to as prehistoric because what's being implied is, well, we know that it was something going around there, but we don't care about that. This is history. This is the history we're talking about. So this is why when you go into public schools or whatever educational system you're in, when they have a history class, they're only teaching you history that they want you to be concerned about. They don't care about anything beyond that because anything beyond that, they call that prehistoric. Okay. So just once kind of go through that. And so, um, so you get better understanding on what you're dealing with. Um, Another thing that um, Miles um, Moreau touched on, he talked about the mindset of these Europeans who are basically Romans. That's who they are. This superiority mindset that they have, that they're better than everybody else, particularly when they when they talk about Africa. Africans are like just, well, we just going to, I remember there was a video that came out not too long ago. They talked about how they were going to run some, um, do some um, tests if um, the pharmaceutical company said, well, we're going to use some Africans for that, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's like, they're the lower people. We just use them for tests. They are guinea pigs, that kind of thing. And it, you know, and people were rightly outraged by that because this is how these Europeans have always seen us, always. I don't care if you want to claim that you're here, you know, you've never been to Africa or whatever, you don't trace through Africa. Or for those of us who do, acknowledge the fact that yes we do come out of that land um it doesn't matter the europeans see you and will always see you as less than where did that mindset come from from the greeks and the romans these are the same people that got together put together that book and sold it to you it's just facts and so this is how they think so when you listen to these people out here that want to say that they are um that they descend from um black portuguese people yes you do have people out there that's that will claim that they're sephardics or the black portuguese you don't want to be that <laughs> you don't want to be that because those were people that enslaved you and we've talked how many times have i've said how many times have i showed you receipt after receipt after receipt after receipt that these people actually are the ones on, now we're going to talk about the portuguese the Portuguese actually are the ones that went into Central and Southern Africa to the Kingdom of Congo and basically cut a deal with the king at that time there. Again, I've, we've gone through all the details here. And first they brought them Christianity and they said, we're going to do a little exchange program. You're going to bring some of your people up to um, Portugal and Spain and you can get to learn our culture. And then we're going to leave some people down here and we get to learn your culture. But sooner or later, that quickly turned into slavery and slavery in Jesus name is out, you know, you can put it that way, but that's what happened. And so that's how we were introduced to Christianity. So when you listen to a lot of these people out here that want to say that Christianity is something that was, we always were Christians and it was an, no, no, that came from Rome. It came from Rome. I mean, I, I, I ain't no way around it. It came from Rome and the Greeks. And so what Miles Monroe was saying to his point, he is absolutely right. Absolutely right. Look at our governments. Look at how our governments do things. When you go into Washington, D.C., look at all the buildings. The buildings are built with Rome and Greek in my, and, 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 and Greek culture in mind. They're not building. They're not looking at Africa. Well, they'll look at Egypt. They, they extract Egypt. Washington, D.C. reflects what they conquered. Let me say that again. Washington, D.C. reflects, I'm talking about the city now, reflects what they, the Greeks and the Romans, have conquered. So you have Rome, of course, is going to represent Roman culture. You have Greek, so it's going to represent that. 
and it's also going to represent Egypt. So as you know, you got the Masonic order and all that down there. So you got pyramids, the one eye stuff and all of that and, and all of that. These are areas that they that represent either who they are or what they conquered. So yes, Africa it can it can be seen in places like Washington DC and other high places of power throughout the world. And but it's Egypt and it's Egypt because it represents what they the Romans and the Greeks what they conquered. You can go in even in um I, I believe it's in um <clears throat> in the banking district in um in in London. Um they still have on those elaborate door on some of the banks, the old banks or elaborate doors. They have like the slaves still all on there and all that. It, they, that that's, that's how prideful these people are. And they're very arrogant. And this is what the system is based off of. And the other point I want to bring out too is it, I thought it was a great point as well. He talked about these, you know, what we was referred to today as Negro spirituals or the, the songs that we would, that we sang you know, in the church world, you know, I'm, I wrote it down here. One of them, he mentioned, okay, he didn't mention this one, but you know, we shall overcome, you know, we shall overcome someday. It's not today. It's someday. So it's always, all the songs are always something that is pushed. It's something that in the future, you're never going to achieve anything until you die. What kind of belief system is that? How does that even bring any kind of happiness in anybody's life? What kind of hope is that? So you, so the reward for your belief in their system is that you get hope once you die. Meanwhile, the same people that's pushing this belief system, oh, they enjoy all their stuff now and they get to enjoy it when they die too. Why is it that in their belief system, you only get one shoe and some hope. Meanwhile, they get everything here and then they get everything when they go up there too. And even the ones that they, the gods and the angels and stuff they created, they get the best seats. Meanwhile, you get one shoe and you might see a street, a street of gold somewhere. They'll probably put you on gold street, meaning that that's the name of the, the street, but ain't no gold on it. <laughs> But this is what I'm trying to say is, you know, so, uh, you know, so again, what Miles Monroe brought out, I thought it was just, just, oh man, he just, it, I mean, you can't get any clearer than that. You can't even get clearer than that. I mean, another song was, um, we'll talk about we shall overcome. And what was it? Um, another one, um, is, um, bread of heaven feed me till I want no more. That's a glutton song. You ever think of that? You ever hear someone sing that bread of heaven? Feed me till I want no more. It's not till I need no more. It's till I want no more. That's gluttony. But go back and listen to a lot of these songs that you grew up on. A lot of these spiritual songs, they were designed like he was implying in this video. They were designed to keep your brain and spiritually to keep you captive in a state of one day we going to get there. One day is going to happen. One day they're going to do something for us. Meanwhile, they're not singing on one day. They're singing, we're doing it now. And we're taking now. And we're building now. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I thought this video, I wanted just to share this video clip because I just thought what he was saying. And, and I know I, I don't I don't get the whole, you know, um, TikTok thing and it's also on YouTube shorts too where half the screen is someone just staring at you and then the other one is the actual video I don't get that you know I'm like can you screw down of the way so I can just watch the whole video but the editing you know I want to make sure that the person who did the editing well, I'm assuming she did got the credit you know because otherwise this video would have been a much longer but I want you to make sure you um kind of keep what uh, Miles and Roe said in this thing because what he's saying is absolutely true you got to understand this matrix and what this matrix is built on the foundation of it it's a greco-roman matrix system 
And unfortunately, many of our people are still caught up in it and are still in love with it. I mean, you think about last point, you think about uh, many of our people who are caught up in Greek culture, black Greek culture. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the uh, the fraternities and sororities. Now, we call it black Greek culture. I want you to think about this as we kind of close this video out right quick. The reason why, when you look at the history of black Greek culture, fraternities and sororities, and even in the Masonics, you know, um, orders and stuff like that, that are black oriented. The reason why these organizations existed in the first place is because our people saw what, how these Greeks and Romans were operating and how they have their secret societies and how there's a certain percentage of them that always get the, the good stuff. And they always look after each other while they look down on everybody else who's not part of the in crowd. That is classic Greek and Roman culture. This is what Maserati was just talking about. Just this whole elitist mindset that we're better than you and you, you know, and all you down here, that's it. So black folks saw that and said, we want that too. Now we're already all the way on the bottom of the totem pole as far as, you know, the system is concerned. So what do we do? We want to create something that put us even lower. We want to fight for the bottom. So anyway, so we created our own system that's very, that mirrors their system. And so this system, the way it's designed is, is the same way that white people do. You go to somewhere like Atlanta or some of these are New York or whatever. Many of you, or at least some of you can even testify um, to this, that there are certain jobs that you got rejected for. You thought you was a shoe in because the hiring manager was black, you black, and you think, okay, they're going to hook me up and you're qualified. They ain't just a black thing. You are legitimately qualified for the position. But the one thing that kept you from not getting that job is the fact that you weren't part of the in crowd. You weren't part of the fraternity. You weren't part of the sorority or whatever. That's Greek. That's that's how the Greeks thought because they thought that we can create these little secret societies or whatever and where we can look down on this other demographic because you're not you didn't make the cut. You didn't cross the burning sands like we did. And then the Romans, no different. They think the same way. So it's a mindset. If you really are trying to get out of this matrix system, then you're going to have to break away from this Roman and Greek mindset. But unfortunately for numbers of our people, that's a very tough thing because things like music, for example, you know, when we talk about gospel music, Christian music, what have you, music is very powerful and has a way of um, 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 implanting certain mindsets that are very hard to just simply walk away from. It's a very powerful thing. And so a lot of our, so not only did they give us a book to say, okay, you follow this. If you follow this real good now, you might make it into heaven. But they also had us sing as a way of basically embedding that even further into our minds, into our psyche and all of that. So it's really embedded in so that it's just, this is just a belief system that we just embrace and, and, and that's it. You know, this is something we're accepting. And so for some people, I should say probably for many people, it's a very difficult thing, but what miles Monroe brought up in this video, I thought was very, very important. And it's something that our people really need to understand that this system in of itself is a Greco Roman system. And, you know, and we got we got to recognize that and we got to break out of it because if we don't. Then we just kidding ourselves. So that's all I have for you, family. Thank you so much for um, clicking in. You guys take care and I'll see you the next time.